and welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole. As part of CGTN's continuing focus on the alleviation of global poverty, this week we're looking at empowering women and why the world can never win the war on want without true gender equality. Education, education, education. Why the classroom is key to ending poverty. Plus caring for the carers. Why the world needs to rethink its approach to social safety nets. And we'll hear what must be done to get women back to work post-pandemic. There is some debate over the exact figures, but what is clear is that the majority of the world's poor are women. Women are more likely than men to be out of the labour market doing unpaid care work. And when they do have work, more likely to work for lower wages in informal jobs. Indeed, gender inequality in the workplace costs the economies of the world's developing countries an estimated $9 trillion a year. So what can be done to close that gap? Well, joining me now from Port Louis is scientist and former president of Mauritius, Amina Gurub fakim uh, Amina, how can female empowerment, innovation, science, technology all come together to help solve the poverty crisis? That's a very, very important question. Uh, if I'm going to put it, because you mentioned I'm from Port Louis, Mauritius, I will put it within the African context. Uh, already we have seen uh, the impact of the pandemic and we have seen how important it was uh, to have a fully equipped and uh, capitalized healthcare system. And to get a capitalized healthcare system calls for investment, and investments in the human capital, investment in the infrastructure, and of course, investment in science. And uh, if we had got this together, I mean, we did get some of it right because uh, Africa has so far been spared of the worst uh, case scenario from the pandemic. But if we are going to go further, if we are going to address prosperity uh, through food security, through water security, through energy security, we will have to look at the science space and science space and also the tool of science to make it become a, a wealth creating mechanism. And uh, if I take, for example, only agriculture on the African continent, we are talking about land space of 60% of the arable land of the world here in Africa. And if we now add technology and science, and of course, uh, train human capital, we are already looking at a sector which can bring $1 trillion business uh, to the continent. So definitely we need more empowerment, more empowerment of young people because Africa is the youngest continent, more empowerment of women because women feed Africa. So we need to make sure that she has access to capital, she has access to technology, she has access to information because she can really push this sector forward and of course reduce poverty. If that's the case, how important is it there should be gender parity in Africa, which certainly isn't the case at the moment, if that's a key component of alleviating poverty? Gender parity, I think, is an issue worldwide. We know that uh, having a, a bird flying with one wing is not possible. So for any economy to prosper, we need to factor in uh, the, the female component and no less than 50%, because otherwise we'll be talking about quota of 30%. So we need to factor in the female ingenuity because it is no longer an ethical thing to do or a moral thing to do. It makes economic sense. So we need to bring in the women competence on board so that we can emerge faster and stronger post-COVID. Certainly gender parity is, is a problem for Africa. But can you give me some examples perhaps of success stories where female empowerment is having a major impact on poorer communities? Uh, well, as I said, uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, the issue of uh, the, the female issue, uh, we're doing quite well on the continent. We already have got five uh, female president on the continent. We already have uh, two actually uh, are in, in, in post. Uh, in fact, if you look at the United States, they just managed to get one vice president. In terms of empowerment, uh, uh, as I said, for the, if, we, if I consider only agriculture, and if you look at the informal sector, the informal sector, we have 80% of the jobs occupied by women. 
So one thing we'll have to do is relook at the informal sector so that we can uh, really empower them because uh, in, in, the, in the COVID era, we found that these women were highly vulnerable because they could not get access to the stimulus package that government could bring uh, to them because they didn't have the infrastructure. So already in the informal sector, in the food sector, in the textile sector, and many manufacturing sectors, they are essentially driven by women. So this is, you know, and we know that uh, um, the informal sector is a very, very important component of the economy of Africa. Uh, so we have to really, you know, kind of surround them with the appropriate uh, infrastructure, the tool, the information, and more importantly, the education. So if we get this right, we'll be addressing not just gender parity, uh, gender uh, justice as well, because we need to make sure that our girls have access to all the best that this world can offer uh, so that we can really pull together and rise and get the continent out of this absolute poverty that some, some, some parts of Africa still experience. You are one of the most eminent female politicians in the world, a former president of Mauritius. Uh, you, you're, you're a member of an exclusive club of uh, women who have led their countries. What advice would you give to young women on the continent of Africa, indeed around the world, uh, so they can push for better representation in what many consider to be a gender-biased world? Uh, interesting you should ask this question because uh, what I'm going to say may seem paradoxical, but women have among themselves the worst foes. The worst enemies to women are women themselves. So the message I have for them is that when a woman is out there, let us make sure that we as a community of women, we strive to, to leave her there for as long as possible because when she's out there shining, she becomes a beacon and a message and of course a very powerful role model for others to rise, be, uh, you know, the younger generations to rise. So let us all take each other by the hand and rise together. Several years ago, you said this. Those nations that go all in on innovation today will own the global economy tomorrow. Do you think that's still the case? And who do you think currently owns the global economy? Uh, and how does that inform the fight against poverty? Well, I'm, going to, I'm afraid I'm going to have to take the example of China. China opened up to the world in 1978 under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping. In fact, the, the Chinese Communist Party is, is uh, celebrating its 100 years of existence. Uh, but Deng Xiaoping opened the economy, and the same can be said for India in the 1990s when uh, Pres Prime Minister Manmohan Singh opened the economy. And we have seen uh, the, the phenomenal uh, uh, progression of China and in fact, not too, not too far, uh, you know, last couple of weeks, we've seen China uh, heading towards space. Now, just imagine come, a country coming out of the cold, 1978, to where we are today. They have moved from famine. They have re removed millions of people out of absolute poverty. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is well before the MDGs were implemented. So uh, China has done phenomenally well. Maybe there are a few pages that we have to take from its book. And the same thing happened when uh, uh, India emerged, because India emerged when it opened the economy, when they realized that uh, investment is no longer needed in hard infrastructure, when they could just move with the brain capacity of their people. And in fact, as we speak today, uh, over 40% of the human capital powering Silicon Valley, United States, they are Indians. So they're Asian, actually. So this is, I think, what we have, the lessons we have to learn from how these countries did it, coming from a very low base and now, you know, really driving the agenda of science, technology, innovation across the world. Indeed, I saw exactly that when I went to Silicon Valley uh, and I saw all, all, what, the nature of all and the, the, where all the workers came from at Oracle, for example. But um, you mentioned uh, China and India uh, and you've mentioned innovation. What type of leadership is needed to embrace not just uh, innovation and technological change, but also investment, which you've also said? What type of leadership can embrace all of those factors to beat poverty? Uh, we need increasingly, uh, I, I will, because I come from the space of science, I would be very tempted to say that we need a technocratically led leadership. Uh, where they can understand the value of, invest of investing in the ecosystem, 
that will provide a space for young people to actually uh, test their ideas and uh, a leadership that can understand that uh, the, 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 the power and of course the, the wealth of a nation resides in the mind of the people and for Africa it is not the minds. And uh, this is the kind of leadership that we need. But more importantly for Africa, because I always say we speak from the vantage point of 60 years uh, post-independent history on average, we have to really look at ourselves as a nation, as a people, as an African nation, African people, to see where our riches are, where our culture resides, and how we can decolonize our brain and our mind and value our own culture and value our own heritage. I think every, all leaders have said, if you don't know where you came from, you will not know where you're heading to. So let us take stock of what we have received from our forebears and uh, plow ahead. Now, let, let's stay with education and science two vital components uh, to beat uh, poverty. You once told a newspaper this, quote, countries that have invested in education have managed to break the cycle of poverty. Um, and despite many campaigns over the years to get women educated, we still don't have enough women, especially in the developing world, going into science. Um, what can be done about that? And how would that change the world if there was a more level playing field there? Well, my country led by example. We made education free in 1976, and we became independent from Britain in 1968. And by the 1980s, those very ladies who were cutting sugar cane, they were those people who could actually manipulate and handle machine in the fledgling uh, free zone where the textile stack sector started started to to, to set uh, you know, foot. So we we made it free for all and for both genders. So when that happened, parents no longer had to feel they, they were making an economic sacrifice by educating the girls because it didn't make economic sense to educate a girl because she would, the, the culture is such that she would be married off and, and leave the family. And the boy had to have priority. So when this happened, I mean, to me, that was a game changer. And uh, we went the extra mile because we also provided social safety net to our people. And to me, uh, education, yes, health also was free, but the social safety net was also a game changer and it is still valid today. And uh, now uh, how do we move into the, the space of science, technology, innovation? Uh, this is where I, in my own little way, I helped create the very first biopark in my country, where I could translate my research uh, results or research finding from academia into an enterprise. And if we get more such initiative, we can find that the youth of Mauritius will become job creators as opposed to job seekers. Academia to uh, innovation uh, and enterprise, that, that's a wonderful example and a great ambition too. Uh, uh, just finally, Amina, are you confident you know your way around academia and innovation and enterprise, that we are winning the war against poverty around the world? Um, no, I'm, I'm afraid we, we are not winning the war uh, uh, on poverty. And I think the past year we have seen the development gains that the developing world had made had been wiped off with the COVID. And uh, the, to me, the biggest challenge is addressing inequality. And the chasm, which is separating the have and the have not, is getting bigger and wider. But still, I think measures are being taken. And I have also said this many times, that we need less philanthropy, but more taxes. People have to learn to pay the taxes. It's only with tax dollars and tax rupees or tax pound that countries will be able to, to bring into the social cause and address social justice. So up until that leadership comes on board and takes the bull by the horn, we will still be having this conversation 10 years down the line. Well, let's hope not, and hopefully people will pay their taxes. Uh, Dr Amina Gurufakim, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Still to come here on the agenda, we'll talk to Guy Ryder, Director General of the International Labour Organisation, about trying to close the gender gap in the workplace. Each day, there are millions of stories. 
Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Murray, what would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to The Agenda. Earlier this year, the World Economic Forum published a report showing that the COVID-19 pandemic had set gender equality back by at least a generation. And a report from the International Labour Organization showed that women are far more likely than men to work in sectors affected by the pandemic and, of course, uh, to take time off to help care for their families. So how could this gender imbalance be corrected? Joining me now is Guy Ryder, the Director General of the ILO. Guy, how can women be better supported and helped out of poverty post-pandemic? Yeah, no doubt about it. Women workers have been amongst the most uh, hard hit by uh, uh, the impact of the, of the pandemic. What, what's happened? Women have lost their jobs in, in larger numbers uh, than men. Uh, why? Firstly, because they are segregated and concentrated in those sectors which have been hardest hit. Uh, secondly, because often they're on relatively insecure uh, employment contracts, so it's easier for them to be uh, shown the door in the first instance. And thirdly, as you've indicated, they've had to pick up those care uh, responsibilities at home. When schools close, uh, when the kids need looking after, women invariably pick it up. And, and what is worrying, I think, in particular, is that nine out of every 10 women who have moved out of their jobs uh, during the pandemic have actually left the labor force. They're not unemployed, they're inactive, as the economists would say. They're simply not participating anymore. So the question becomes, how and will these people come back, these women come back into the labor force? And I think, a large part of that, I mean, some of these are familiar problems, but I think we have, and it's one of the lessons of the pandemic, to really look uh, in a quite new way about the provision of care in our societies. Now, we all know that women pick up the, uh, the great majority of unpaired care responsibilities uh, for reasons which have to do with tradition as much as anything else. Now we have, and also from other lessons learned uh, from the pandemic, we have to be serious about creating a care economy which does two things. It provides enough high quality care to those who need it, be they older citizens or, or to kids, and then we have to professionalize the, uh, the, the care economy. This should be not unrecognized unpaid work. It should be part of the world of work and treated as such. And if we were to do that, Women, I think, will be um, enabled to participate in all sorts of ways on a much more equal basis in the world of work than they are right now. It's one of the tools in our armory. I think there are many other things, pay transparency, uh, strengthened anti-discrimination measures, but there's a lot that we could do. And there is a sort of a, a downside to the options ahead of us. You know, there is a sense in which what we are witnessing during this pandemic is what we rather um, clumsily call the re-traditionalization of gender roles. That is to say, women are being again told they're part of the, uh, the family bargain, as it were, is to stay at home, look after the kids, let's get the men back to work and get things moving again. If we go back down that road, then we will certainly be going back, as our friends at the World Economic Forum uh, indicate, 
to something no, which belongs to the past and should remain in the past. And, and of course, here you're talking about safety nets, aren't you? Uh, and you have a programme which is called Better Work Programme, which is aimed at just that. It's aimed at addressing uh, inequality uh, issues. So how have we got to this point? Is it a result of poor policies? What does the world need to do to tackle this kind of uh, gender equality? Yeah, well, let, let me just give you, you know, there's a few things in your question. Let me just give you a, a couple of sets of figures. One of the things that this pandemic has shown us is that the majority of people in the world, majority of working people and their families, they do not have social protection, or at least not adequate social protection. It's about between six and seven out of uh, every 10 workers has inadequate social protection. So when the pandemic has hit, these people have been left high and dry. What would be the cost of putting in place a basic social protection floor for all low-income countries. The answer is, every year, just over $1.2 trillion. $1.2 trillion. Now, if I'd have put that proposition to you two years ago, you would probably, along with everybody else, have said, that's an outlandish number. How could we possibly imagine that that is doable? Post-pandemic, we found $16 trillion to deal with the effects of the pandemic. Uh, it's a matter of choice and perspective. Uh, things that we have considered impossible uh, to resource in the past, be it social protection. I could also mention the cost of uh, transition of the world of work to carbon neutrality, the commitments made in the Paris Agreements, which have not been honoured, but come in about 800 or 100 uh, $100 billion a year. You know, these things were considered impossible. Now, you can say, is that a matter of financial orthodoxy? Is it a matter of political will and political choices? Or is it something else? Call it what you will. But we have taken decisions not to do those things. And the pandemic is making us pay the price of those past failures. I would call them failures. I would call them policy uh, mistakes. Recently, Guy, uh, you said China's achievements in eradicating severe poverty served as an example, your word, example, to other countries. What is China doing right that other countries are not doing? Well, the thing they've done right is produce the results. I, I'm, I'm somebody who believes very strongly in the, uh, the strength of results. China's performance in the elimination of uh, extreme and moderate poverty is, I think, unparalleled. I think this is generally... Uh, acknowledged in the world. And I think what's important about the Chinese example is that it has made both poverty elimination and the creation of jobs uh, a very explicit objective of, of national policy. Now, I wish we could see uh, around the world the same prioritization and explicit commitment to decent job creation, to poverty elimination. Because if we started from that starting point, from that premise, that these are the priorities of national policy, then I think the recovery that we are trying to put together right now uh, would start off in the right direction. But I'm fearful uh, that that's not the case. I'm fearful that we're looking at other objectives, we're looking at other parameters, and not prioritizing what, particularly after the pandemic, deserves to be prioritized. And it's a matter of choice. It's a matter of political choice. Now, you earlier said, or we've been reporting, the WF uh, report said that the pandemic had set back gender equality by a generation. Um, you've also said that five years of progress towards ending um, working poverty has been undone by the pandemic. What does the world need to do now to get back on track? What are, what are the first steps you're telling the policymakers and governments to take now. Uh, you've called for a comprehensive, coordinated and human-centric approach. What does that look like? Right. What does that mean, even? Yeah, right, what does it mean? Well, I mean, what, what it means in, in, in the first instance, I think, is, uh, and this is today's uh, business, uh, we need, and this has to have international coordination, or otherwise we're going to get these dual-track recoveries and, and the haves and the have-nots going in different directions. We have to have common purpose in stimulating the global economy, uh, to keeping uh, enterprises going, to support people's incomes, and given the unequal distribution of fiscal space, there needs to be a high degree of international cooperation uh, in that. So we need to go into an expansive uh, setting in terms of global policy making. And then you have to focus in on the labour market. You have to see 
who's in trouble in the labour market and where the potential for the future is. So we need, as we have talked about, we need to make specific efforts uh, to have women come back into the world of work and on the equal terms that we have discussed. We need to prevent this lockdown generation of young people from being lost to the world of work, targeted policies of that nature. And I think above all, and this underpins everything, we need dialogue. We need to have policymakers in the world of work. We need to have governments, employers and workers sit down and talk to each other in ways that we seem to be finding more and more difficult to do. Why? Because, you know, when you do talk things through, you get solutions in the first place, practical solutions, things that work because you've heard all voices. You get solutions which are fair, they're equitable, they're legitimate because people have had their say and their inputs. And in that way, you can move forward. And, you know, there are alternatives before us. A pandemic, as I've said, shows us there is not just one policy setting. There are alternatives. They need to be explored and they need to be acted upon in a way, and I, I can understand your question, which does say that the objective of our policy is to improve the working and living experience of individuals, of people, you know, and people, the elimination of poverty, for example, their health status, these need to be made the explicit objectives of policy and financial macroeconomic settings should be designed to contribute to that objective. It's really important to say what our objectives are. Well, Guy, you've certainly given us some examples of the way forward. Guy Ryder, Director General of the International Labour Organization, many thanks for your time. It's my pleasure. Empowering women to take back control of their lives is economically crucial if we are to lift the world out of poverty. That was the very clear message that was sent in our recent Innovation Action Change in-depth look at global poverty. And despite some progress being made, few countries are achieving complete equality and women are still more likely than men to live in poverty. In fact, the pandemic only served to widen the gender poverty gap, with more women losing their jobs than men, often having to leave work to look after their children or relatives. And it seems the only way to close that gap would be to revolutionise the global care system at a cost of over a trillion dollars a year. But if that seems an unaffordable amount, it's worth remembering that according to the charity Oxfam, gender inequality in the economy costs developing countries alone an extraordinary nine trillion dollars a year. And here the pandemic may in fact have taught the world a valuable lesson as Guy Ryder explained, that when it is most needed, money can be found to change the world. And money is needed now more than ever, not only to improve social care, but to ensure that women are offered equal opportunities in all areas of life, not least in their education. Progress has been made in this area. Two thirds of the world has reached gender parity in primary education. But when two thirds of the world's illiterate population are female, there is clearly far more to be done. Men and women, governments, employers, employees, all need to work together to ensure that no one misses an opportunity simply because of their gender. After all, as Amina Gurib Fakim put it, it's impossible for a bird to fly with only one wing. Don't forget you can watch everything from past agenda episodes and find additional exclusive content on our website, cgtn.com slash Europe or on our YouTube channel. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at CGTN Europe. And don't forget you can find lots more content on poverty alleviation on our special webpage, cgtn.com slash innovation action change. Coming up on a future agenda, as Germany gets ready for life post Merkel, we'll consider what the future might hold for the country's new Chancellor. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the Agenda team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs>